Anyway, the topic, uh, my topic was actually selected by Don Sari and uh, already more than a year ago. So there you have it. Now, I have here a list of a number of um, anatomical differences between us and the rest of the animals, particularly the great apes. And the list could have been different and could have been larger, but these are differences that are important, are obvious and significant, particularly for today's talk. First, erect posture and bipedal gait. That is very fundamental. That happened probably already by between seven and six million years ago, just at the beginning of the hominids, the, the, the lineage that leads to us after separation from the lineage going to the chimps, who are our closest relatives. And it has to do with our ancestors moving from the forest to the savanna. Now, a, an implication of bipedalism, and by, by the way, bipedalism was used at first probably one use one on the ground, but eventually evolved itself. But by about five million years ago, our ancestors were as just as bipedal as we are. So there's a long time. What bipedal implies is it leaves the arms, the forelimbs, limbs, from being a use for jumping from branch to branch, branch to branch, to branch in the trees, or for knuckle walking. The great apes, when on the ground, they walk by resting on their knuckles, and they need very long arms. Um, we had the arms free, and more importantly, the hands free. So our hand evolved. Our hands had very little to do other than gross similarity with that of the apes. Our hands are fantastically uh, resourceful uh, tools, if you wish. We can handle very small objects. We can handle and build larger objects. We feel temperature the roughness of the surface, and so on. And that was very important because is doubtless the evolution of the hand, which in turn was a consequence of the evolution of bipedalism, that led to the to tool making. Um, and as I will argue in a moment, that led to the large brain and therefore to our exalted intelligence. We have a brain which is about four times as large as that of a gorilla, or a little more, that of a chimpanzee. So there has been a tremendous evolution in brain size. The reduction of jaws and remodeling of the face has to do with the fact that as the brain became larger, the head became much larger. And the head had to give in somewhere in order for the birth of the baby to be possible through the birth canal of the mother. And well, something that happened is the jaws became much smaller. The teeth also became much smaller. Um, cryptic ovulation. This is a topic that I will come back to, but um, that I will tell you already that I think is very important. It's not given the importance, the significance that I believe it has, and I will try to convince you it has in, in human evolution. When primates go in estrus, the female, females go into estrus, the sternal genitalia enlarge and acquire bright color. So the female is advertising, I am receptive, I'm um, fertile. So the male comes, mates, and leaves. There's absolutely no reason for the male to remain with the female um, because the probability of fertilization is very close to 100% when the female is fertile. Um, when I say he does, does not have any reason to be there, I'm speaking implicitly about genes, genes that will favor that male to go somewhere else and try to mate again. Those genes will be favored because are more likely to be transmitted to more progeny. Uh, so I'm going to use often this shortcut kind of language. Um, with a woman, the male does not know once he's fertile. So the male comes and mates and has to stay there and mate again and again. And of course, the other side of it is standard female sexual receptivity. In the primates, when the female is not fertile, the genitals contract. Even if the male tries to meet, it's physically impossible, becomes physically impossible. So in the case of, of our ancestors, this 
happened that made that relevant from the point of view of fitness and, and a genes being favored for the male to stay there and keep mating and form the unit that now we consider, the, uh, we will call the, or I will call, the nuclear family, a man and a woman, a male and a female, and their children. And anticipating what I, uh, something I will say a little more in a moment, that made it possible the social organization of humans. Because in the organization of, say, the apes at most uh, uh, primates, the males compete with each other in various ways, uh, various systems of organization. But once you have the nuclear family, there is a very reason for this nuclear family to become associated with another nuclear family and another and another, because there is not direct competition among males to become dominant and do much of the ma mating. So I think cryptic ovulation is at the root of social organization in humans, which in turn, I would say, has a lot to do with evolution of morality and religion. Uh, we develop much more slowly. When we are born, we are much less developed, say, than the baby chimpanzee or a gorilla. That makes, again, the, form the um, stability of the, so the nuclear family to last longer, because the baby is dependent on the mother and the father for being taken care of. Unexposable possible education, extended education. And then this uh, vocal tract and larynx, that of course has to do with the possibility of spoken language. Uh, chimps and, and don't speak for various reasons, but they certainly they cannot emit sounds like vowels and consonants as we do. In some respects, more important yet are behavioral differences between us and the apes. And I list here intelligence. And again, how do you uh, what do you identify what attributes of our exalted intelligence are significant? For reasons that may become apparent, I have identified three, uh, three here. One is our ability to form abstract concepts, to form mental images of realities that do not exist, that like beauty or world or whatever. Uh, categorizing, seeing objects as members of general categories, this pair belongs to the pair category, and therefore all my experiences I have had about pair directly uh, are relevant when I'm compared with this other object, which is an apple, and I know about apples. And then reasoning. I suppose I don't have to make the point that reasoning, making inferences from premises to conclusions, whether formally or not, is one of the attributes of our intelligence. We have symbolic language, and I put in parentheses creative because um, animals communicate gestures, songs, and in other ways. There is a, a group of animals, a general group of animals that communicate with symbolic language, which are the, mostly the social insects. Using the example of the honeybee, when a honeybee female a, a worker is um, going around looking for food and finds a food source, she flies back to the hive and starts to make what is called a, a dance um, with the shape of an egg. A waggle dance is sometimes called because she's moving the tail a lot. All the bees come around this, this worker as she's, she's doing this dance and she's telling them the direction in which the food source is in relation to the sun and the distance with this, through this motion in ways that we, uh, I, I, I will not go into the details. So it's symbolic communication, but it is fixed, it's it in the genes. No, it's, it is not creative, like w w our language is creative uh, conspicuously in two ways. We uh, create different words and we can create an infinite number of words and it's creative also in, in that we can combine words in an unlimited number of possibilities. Um, now, oops, self-awareness and death awareness is going to be very important for the rest of my talk. I'm going to make the point, and I will not spend too much time trying to convince you, because very often uh, people do not, are not willing to accept what I'm going to say. We are the only animal that is aware that exists as an individual. 
my dog doesn't, a chimp doesn't. May have, in the case of a chimp, some incipient, uh, um, in, you know, insight into it. Uh, we know that we exist as individuals, and and we know that the animals don't. Why I do I know that the animals don't? Because a consequence of self-awareness is death awareness. If I know that I exist as an individual, I know that I'm going to die because I see all the members, all the other members of the species dying. And if I know that I'm going to die when other people die, other individuals of my species die, I will treat these individuals with respect. Ceremonial burial of the dead, liturgical burial of the dead, if you wish, is practiced only by humans. I will raise the question of when in human evolution that may have come about, but no other animal does that. So we are the only, the only animal who is self-aware, and we are death aware as a consequence, and it's also the evidence for self-awareness. We make tools, and we have technology. Now, some the chimps sometimes make simple tools, take branches of a tree, and we use it for some purpose or other. I don't think that needs to be argued that no animal has a technology of the kind that we humans have. And of course, they don't have science, literature, and art, ethics, and religion. Very elaborate social organization <laughs> and cooperation. The social insects have very elaborate social organization. In, uh, we are familiar with workers and the queen and the, and the males. But there are some ants where there are five or six different kinds of, of uh, individuals of social strata within the, 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 the nest. Um, but again, we nothing like our social organization the flexibility, the possibilities, the size, and the like. And no, nothing, I suppose, needs to be said about legal codes and political uh, organizations. Now, ethicists or philosophers dealing with ethics <coughs> say there are three different kinds of issues. One is meta-ethics, which tell us what, why we ought to do what we ought to do. Normative ethics, which is what is what we ought to do, the rules, and practical ethics, which is applying the moral norms to practical situations. There are, have been historically, historical, the history of humankind, going all the way back to Aristotle and earlier, uh, so more than whatever, 24 centuries or so, um, a number of metaethical doctrines which uh, proper ethicists writing a textbook about the subject. We have like 20 entries or so. But I am listing here some which are the most different one from the other and to tell you the kind of things why I'm talking about. First, moral realism. <coughs> this is the philosophical position that there are moral <coughs> facts, that there are things which are good in themselves and there are things which are evil in themselves, which is not because some authority or God tells us, it's just that he's healing his bed, stealing his bed. Um, other metaethical doctrines rely on religion. What says what is right and what is evil um, is, depends on what our religion tells us. Utilitarianism, something that became uh, very popular, particularly in the UK and other places, starting in the 18th century, but particularly in the 19th century, that what determines what is good is what benefits the largest number of people. So if I have an action, the consequences of that action will impact other people, and the more people benefit from that, the more that action is, is morally good. Positivism, there are no rational foundations for morality. If they are if the emotional decisions at the personal level, or they are imposed by civil authority, by governments. As I said, I could multiply these and, and tell you about variations of them. But when one looks at the, uh, in the past, at discussions of ethics, one encounters situations like this with Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas is considered still today probably the greatest theologian of, of Christianity. He lived in the 13th century, and when he 
says, why do we have the moral norms that we have? He says, there are three kinds of sources. One is God's law, religion. There is also natural law. He believes there are some uh, moral facts, as it were. And finally, positive uh, law, the civil authority. Well, Darwin came in, in 1859. He published The Origin of Species. And of course, in 1872, they, they extended the theory of evolution by natural selection to humans. And now, philosophers, biologists, all sorts of people started to try to explain morality in terms of evolution. Seeing now ethics, morality, as the part of the evolutionary process. And enormous number of writings in the second half of the 19th century and all through the 20th century to the present, although excitement has seem, seems to me to have reduced in the last 50 years or so. I'm going to use uh, two examples from the middle of the 20th century, Julian Hasley and Waddington, two evolutionists, and an older one, Harry Spencer he was a younger contemporary of Darwin, and he is perhaps the first person who took a position in this respect, other than Darwin himself. Um, and he says, well, Darwin has told us that what the world functions, the way the world works, is the struggle for existence. Those who win, win. So that's the, the first rule of morality. Those who win have the right to win. So they say, there's, there's no other reason to think that morality comes from anywhere else. It's just we struggle and, and we get as far ahead as we can. Um, there are many reasons to criticize this uh, social Darwinism, but uh, Thomas Huxley, who was a younger contemporary of Darwin, uh, almost exact contemporary of Spencer, um, criticized it by making the argument that the, which is now called the naturalistic fallacy. Uh, that term was not introduced until 1903 by uh, Moore, but it's a criticism that Hume had made of some of the ethical treatises of his time of the 18th century, where people start to describe the world is this way and this way and this way, and families are this way and that way, and societies are this way and the other way, and therefore, we ought to do this or ought to do that. So derive moral principles from, from, factual, uh, fact, from factual observations. And Hume says there is no logical connection between is and ought. You cannot go from something, the fact that something is this way to say it ought to be that way. That's what we call the naturalistic fallacy nowadays. And that's what uh, Herbert Spencer used as a criticism of, um, I mean, Thomas Huxley as a criticism of Spencer. Julian Huxley, I, not, I realized I should be moving a little faster since I want to cover two subjects rather than one, uh, morality and religion. Um, these are distinguished evolutionists. Uh, Julian Huxley said, well, not everything that happens in evolution is good. But there are lines of evolution that have been progressive. For example, the mammals. And Waddington reduced that and made the same argument, human evolution. Humans are the most progressive. Well, progress cannot be discussed in biological terms. It's, a, it's obviously a, a value term. And, and so there are many reasons, including arguing the naturalistic fallacy against these proposals. Now. I am going to say that all through this century and a half since Darwin, the person who got it more nearly right with respect to the foundations of morality was Darwin. And what I'm going to tell you is a little bit in the next two statements, a little bit of interpretation on my part, because Darwin is not always consistent. There are very reasons to read him the way that it is said in this statement, uh, an animal with well-defined social instincts like parental and filial affection, would inevitably acquire a moral sense of conscience as soon as his intellectual powers had become as well or nearly as well developed as in men. 
that's, what I'm, that's going to be my first um, uh, thesis, as it were, that we are moral beings because of our exalted intelligence. Once we acquire intellectual powers comparable, uh, as we do have them, we, can, we become moral beings. We, by necessity, evaluate our actions in terms of the consequence they have for others. And then, and it's even more interpretation on my part here, uh, another text, I do not wish to maintain that any strictly social animal, if its intellectual faculties were become as active and as highly developed as in men, would acquire the same moral sense as ours. Uh, they might have a sense of right and wrong, that are led by it to follow widely different lines of conduct. I should make an observation, which probably is obvious to you, that I uh, want to declare. Darwin didn't write that with a Spanish accent. I had the accent for, <laughs> for color. Uh, anyway, what the way we can interpret this is that he's telling us, you have animals who will become intelligent, they will have morality, but they will not have the same rules necessarily, the same norms of morality. So that I am going, is going to allow me to establish a distinction between the capacity for ethics, that is evaluating actions as good or evil, and the codes of ethics, the norms by which we identify what is right and what is wrong. Again, the two quotes of, Davies, of, of Darwin will say, the capacity for ethics comes from our exalted intelligence. Code of ethics, now introduce a different term, come from our culture, from this distinctive of different uh, human cultures. That does not come necessarily the particular codes of ethics from our intelligence. <coughs> this distinction, I think, is obvious. But sometimes I make this comparison to, to make it clear what I mean. It's comparing it with language. It's clear that the capacity for symbolic verbal communication is very different from the language we speak. I'm going to argue that the capacity for ethics, being ethical beings, is very different from the codes of ethics. So why we are ethical beings, why we evaluate some actions as good and others as evil? I believe that because we have these three attributes which are distinctively human and that necessarily imply that we are going to judge our actions as right or wrong. First, the ability to anticipate um, the consequences of our own actions, um, ability to make value judgments and to choose between alternative courses of action. A few words about each. <coughs> For there being morality, we have to be able to anticipate the consequences of our actions. Pulling the trigger is not in itself a moral action. It's a moral action if I know that, I'm, that pulling the trigger is going to shoot the, ball, the bullet which is going to kill my enemy. The reason why the action that I make becomes moral is in terms of the consequences that follow. So we need to anticipate the consequences of our own actions. Where does that come from? Um, I, um, oop, I am going in the wrong direction. <laughs> Sorry about that. OK. Um, <coughs> by Pedal Gate, free hand, tool making. I would argue that the enlargement of the brain, or becoming very intelligent, has to do with tool making. The argument is as follows. You, I have already made the argument for, uh, for by Pedal Gate and, and tool making. Is that making tools requires forming mental images of realities that are not present. I make a knife for cutting, or I make an arrow for the purpose of hunting. I'm going to use them later. I have to form mental images of realities that are not present. That requires advanced intelligence. And um, so a positive feed loop, back feed loop was established between tool making and enlarged brain. Among our ancestors, those who were able to make better tools, more useful tools, uh, have a better chance of surviving and procreating. Who were able to make better tools? Those who were smarter. 
and they survive better, they make better tools, again, m smarter and more tools, better and better tools. So that's my argument for the enlargement of the brain. Um, Ed Wilson has not yet published this book, so I suppose none of you have seen it. It's not yet out. I was sent a, an advanced copy for good reason. It will be uh, out in two or three months. And see how he explains it quite differently, the evolution of intelligence. He says, the climb, talking about higher cognitive ability, our exalted intelligence, had become in Africa during the, our abilene precursors. He's talking about Homo habilis, our ancestors that lived about two million years ago. We know that's when the brain starts to grow. Habilis, Homo habilis ancestors uh, have no more than about 350 or so cc or grams of uh, gray matter of brain. With Homo habilis start to increase very quickly goes to 600, 800, and eventually to Homo erectus to up to 1,000, and now we have our 1,300 or 1,400 cc brain. So he's saying that the climb, the increase in brain, in intelligence, have started with Homo habilis to Homo erectus. At that point, the forebrain began its phenomenal growth. growth. What ignited this change? The clue to the advance lies in the initial pre-adaptation that had carried a few other evolving animal species in the history of life that had managed to cross the eusociality threshold. Wilson is a great writer and very clear, uh, and usually writes in simple sentences. This is quite a, a mouthful. But um, what he is saying there is that it was social life, the beginning of social life. He does not link it with um, cryptic ovulation in the way I do it. But be that as it may, it is true. Probably by the time of Homo habilis, our ancestors started to live in groups and form eusocial institutions, eusocial groups, which in, in the animal world exist at least to a, an advanced state, to an advanced condition, only in the social insects. There are some mammals and other uh, organisms that are social, including some that uh, Sai was telling about today, some microorganisms, but uh, sophisticated, complex social organization exists among the termites, the ants, the bees, and the wasps, to an extent much greater than to any other animal, and of course it exists in humans. And he says uh, that whatever it is that makes possible the development of social sociality am among the social insects, namely social association per se, is what also make possible for us to become very intelligent beings. Now, this is, these are two definitions uh, that he gives in the book. Individual selection, this is for those of you who are not population geneticists and not have read about these things. Individual selection is the result of competition for survival and reproduction among members of the same group. Group selection consists of competition between societies through both direct conflict and differential competence in exploiting the environment. Well, these are definitions which are definitions. There's no much that needs to be said about them. But um, I bring them up uh, because here Ed Wilson has taken a 180 degrees change. Um, Ed Wilson sanctified um, the, the, the discovery of what he was called kin selection um, that in, in, in the 60s particular number of authors uh, uh, that are well known to those of us, and we saw the photo of one of them early today, um, started to argue that kin selection, that is the selec selection, uh, I mean the kin, kin selection is important, and this is a way to explain the social organization of bees and wasps and ants. Put it in human terms, the argument will go as follows. <coughs> Assume that I see one of my um, sons, or for the matter, one of my brothers, in great danger of death. That is going to be a great risk for me to try to save it. 
if the risk for me of dying as a consequence is less than 50%, the death of probability of death of my son or my brother, genes will be favored that make me take that risk. So that's how social life uh, evolves in the social insects, because it turns out, and I will not tell you how this calculation is made, that in bees, uh, particularly in the hives where there's only one queen, it's a modification of that when there are several, um, the worker bees share more genes in common with the other workers, 75%, that they share with their mother or the mother with their daughters. So natural selection will favor, actually, the more and more daughters and fewer and fewer queens or mothers, because that is what is, you know, 75% of the genes in, in common. Well, um, Ed Wilson, who became with his uh, important book in 75, the founder of, and, and the book has the title Sociobiology, and it's a discipline who spread, which has spread and has many, many followers. Uh, Richard Dawkins, for example, among the more popular writers, and he's a distinguished scientist on his own, with a book called the Selfish Gene. This is the idea that what is happening in our behavior is, is the genes are being selfish. They are trying to propagate themselves, not necessarily us. And that's what is happening with the honeybee or happens when I risk my life to save a relative. Now, Ed Wilson had turned all around and said, all is a matter of social life, of group selection. This is a shock for, has been a shock for many of his, uh, many of the sociobiologists and many people, evolutionary psychologists and, and, and others. Um, he points out this, which would not be subscribed by many of the proponents of, of um, sociobiology, although he calls it an iron rule. Selfish individuals beat altruistic individuals. I would agree with that. In a, within a social group, you are selfish, your genes are ahead of those who are altruistic. The reason is that the, the altruistic has to invest some of its energy of his resources for the benefit of the group. The selfish does not invest that, but benefits from the altruist. So in, within groups, the um, selfish individuals, selfish gene, will be favored. And from there come all the arguments that I was referring to a moment ago of sociobiology and related th theories. Uh, but if groups of altruists, he adds, be group of selfish individuals. You have, and, and Darwin would agree very much with that, you have different groups, and one of them consists primarily of altruists and, and the other of selfish individuals. The group which consists of altruists is going to be to perform better because everybody's helping everybody else, and they are all benefited from each other and the environment and the like. The, as I said, the shift now for Wilson is to have changed from being all for the selfish gene and now being all for social groups. Let me say something about the ability to make value judgments. It has to do, in my view, with the ability to categorize that I was listing among one of the three intellectual abilities, basic intellectual abilities of humans, of seeing a pair as belonging to the category of pairs and then an, an apple to the category of apples. Because then when we have a, an action or an object or so, we can see it as a member of general category and therefore pass judgment about it. Um, the idea is that if, you know, pulling the trigger is not a moral action unless I think that killing my enemy is moral, is, is desirable or undesirable. But this in terms of the consequence again, but I have to see the consequences of this action as, as belonging to a general category. For there being morality, there has to be free will. And that's a very complex problem, and I'm going to discuss it. I'm going to assume it, although not everybody would agree um, that free will is real, but I will leave it for the sake of time. Um, in recent times, these three terms come over about in the evolutionary literature and the literature about ethics and social organization. And of these terms, empathy is the oldest one, but according to the Oxford Dictionary, the first use goes to 1904. But the current meaning is very different. Is having sympathetic feelings for others. 
in a short predisposition. Um, theory of mind uh, is a concept developed by an American uh, anthropologist, philosopher, whatever you have, uh, Michael Tomasello, starting about 20 years ago, which has become very popular. This is the idea that humans, and also other animals, but particularly humans, can avoid, cannot avoid incorporating into their thinking what they think other people are thinking. You, to simplify the matter, you see somebody be looking sad, you will feel a little bit sad, identify with that feeling. This is what the theory of mind, and I bring it up because this is very much in the literature. And finally, mirror neurons, even more recent uh, notion uh, as um, um, introduced by somebody called Rizzoletti at the University of Parma in Italy, is based in a discovery that he made that when he was training restless monkeys and the rewards were little races, and then he was studying the brain, and he realized when a monkey gets a racing, some neurons fire. But then he found out that if he himself would pick up a racing to eat it, or another monkey will pick a race into it, the same neuron would be firing, even the, the monkey is not getting the racing. So these are mirror neurons, and I would not belabor these notions anymore, or not much more, just to, to put them in context. Uh, Steve Pinker, in his most recent book, which is a big book, but it is a wonderful book, uh, it will be probably more wonderful, it will be one third shorter, <laughs> but uh, there's Pinker writing. and. Uh, he says the empathy is the only kinds of sympathy. We have to read it, to see it as sympathetic concern for others. Not only about feeling the same things that others feel, but it has to be seen with a sympathetic cons concern so that we prompt us to feel the pain of others and to align their interests with our own. This is all related uh, to, oh, this is, I was telling you the thing about Rizzoletti. This is all related to what I was uh, telling you a moment ago as the first of the conditions for there being ethics, the capacity for ethics, uh, that um, I, give, I listed three attributes. The first one, um, being able to anticipate the consequences of your own actions. Empathy and to a certain extent theory of mind and, and, uh, uh, the, and, and the like and the mirror neurons are sort of reduced to almost an automatic process rather than a reflective process. Well, I made this distinction, and I told you, trying to make it clear what I mean, the, I made a comparison with language. So what I'm going to argue now is the um, codes of ethics are the result of cultural evolution, not a biological evolution. They are have been and continue to be arguments between philosophers and biologists about whether morality is biological or not, or is social and cultural. Uh, very often they are arguing about different things. Some philosophers uh, very often are arguing about cultural evolution and the norms of morality, which I'm arguing are the result of cultural evolution. Why biologists who argue the morality, like Wilson and many others, is, is biologically determined are thinking about the capacity for ethics, the disposition to judge some actions as good or evil. Um, there is cultural evolution, and I'm going to have to move fast. I didn't realize that it was, would take me so much time to go through these things. Uh, the, for there being evolution, there has to be heredity. Traits have been transmitted. There has to be variation, so there can be differential reproduction, natural selection. And with respect to culture, it's obvious that we have variation among individuals, among groups, and from time to time. And I am going to leave it at that, but I think that even in a group as homogeneous as this, probably we'll have different moral norms or moral uh, preferences with respect to things like whether abortion is morally right or not under certain circumstances and the like, or using stem cells. But there's, no, there's obvious there is variation there is also cultural selection. Now, cultural selection, uh, that is natural selection with respect to culture, uh, is not association 
associated with biological reproduction. It occurs by imitation, learning, and assimilation. And here they take an example, monotheism. Monotheism was probably invented in the original meaning when it was a tribal god by, uh, in the early times of, Christ of uh, the, uh, the uh, Judeo Christian tradition, that is, in the time, early times of Israel, of Abraham, and shortly thereafter. Then, several times later, so quite a few centuries later, during the time of the captivity of Babylon, the notion of monotheism in Israel changes. It becomes, changes from being, there is a God for us, the God of the Israelites, into there being a universal God, an omnipotent God. And it's uh, the time of some of the great prophets, particularly the second Isaiah and others, who made a shift, a dramatic shift, because the Ten Commandments say you should not worship other gods. There are other gods for other tribes, but you should worship only our own. Um, well, I would say with respect of uh, codes of ethics that they are the result of cultural transmission, cultural selection through time. Different cultures at different times, tribes and social groups have tried different systems and they have evolved and what we have now is the result of the long-term evolution. We create difference between groups among individuals too, and as I said, from time to time. And of course, codes of ethics, so they have a component, which is civil authority, and for religious people, they have a, a religious component, the divine authority. One thing that deserves saying about cultural evolution, which is relevant to all other aspects, cultural revol evolution, is that it's much more rapid that it is directed, because we don't have to wait for spontaneous mutations, most of which are harmful, that it is cumulative, and the group selection works. That is, that those groups who have better norms, uh, when we are talking about morality, are more likely to succeed than alternative groups. Now, here I have a statement from Darwin, which I call the moral optimism of Darwin, and again, uh, with a Spanish accent, oops. There can be no doubt that a tribe, including many members, um, who from possessing in a high degree the spirit of patriotism, fidelity, obedience, courage, and sympathy, were always ready to give aid to each other, so they would be altruistic, and to sacrifice themselves, would be victorious over most other tribes. This is group selection. And this would be natural selection at that level of groups. At all times through the, throughout the world, tribes have supplanted other tribes, cultural evolution, and as morality is one element in their success, the standard of morality, and here comes the optimism, and the number of well-endowed men will thus everywhere tend to rise and increase. These standards of morality are going to increase. So these are my conclusions, and I um, believe that there is an important component in, 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 bio, in, in morality, which is biological, and therefore in this textbook, which is a fairly substantial book that I published in 2007, I have, which I think is relatively new for textbooks on human evolution, a good long chapter dedicated to the evolution of morality. Uh, so a few words about uh, the evolution of rel religion. If I am evaluating the time correctly, I have about six minutes left. Uh, so, but I only need an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, first of all, I'm quoting this from my thesis mentor, the great middle 20th century evolutionist, Theodosius Dobzhansky, uh, who says that humans have ultimate concern. For him, this was in a religious sense. But, bit as it may, I think, human. I mean, religion is a human universal. Whatever tribes and cultures have left a residue of what they were, they always have a religious component. So if it's a human universal, there's a good reason to try to explore whether it is biologically biological or not. And I, uh, my very quick uh, explanation, because of lack of time, of the sources of religion. Why are we religious? I think there are two related cause issues. One is that we humans look for explanation of things and explanations of natural phenomena. And when we don't know how to explain them, 
we attribute them to supernatural agents. Because some contemporary of ours keep doing that. That's what is called the God of the gaps. They still don't know about the origin of life. So they must have been created by God. It's a self-defeating policy because eventually we will explain the origin of life and we explain the human evolution. But there is no uh, question that historically through human culture, human history, that people have been, cultures have looked for causal explanations and therefore had made recourse to the supernatural or the preternatural and of course looking for the existence of the world itself. The other component is existential anxiety. We know that we will die. Let's go back to self-awareness and death awareness. We know we will die. So what happens next? So religion tends to alleviate that anxiety and of course in some forms of religion gives us a, the notion there's going to be an afterlife. Um, I could explain the, these two evolutionary developments. One starting tool making, larger brain, exalted intelligence. I went through this. Cryptic evolution at the root of the nuclear family and the, therefore the formation of tribes. Um, more about uh, the, the evolution of intelligence, self-awareness, death awareness, anxiety. Humans are receptive to religious revelations. And uh, oop, here the other component, tribalism, I call it tribalism, cryptic ovulation leading to the nuclear family, to group association, tribes and societies, and therefore search for leaders and opportunities for shamans, magicians, prophets and priests, which are traditional components of the of the evolution of religion, and also they provide us with creation means and, and, and moral rules. And I will leave it at that because it is my time. Uh, oh, I will say one word about when the rit ritual burial of the death came in human evolution. That's a very simple, we don't know. Uh, we know the Neanderthals bury ceremonially the dead. We find children uh, buried in possessions and with animals and with objects and adults too. Uh, then what about Homo erectus, say one million years ago, or one and a half million years ago? There are some inklings. Some people have interpreted that Homo erectus was also practicing a ceremonial ritual of the dead. We don't know. But of course now in Homo sapiens it is universal. Thank you. Francisco, will you take some questions? Okay. Well, let me start with Peter. This is more a comment than a question. Which I've known Peter even longer than I have known you. He was a little child. <laughs> I was his chairman. <laughs> anyway, go ahead, Peter. So it, it seems to me you can't get tools without at least a, a bit of morality because uh, it turns out that it requires pretty big groups to, to sustain any uh, tool traditions of any yeah. sophistication. So we know from the uh, this uh, Tasmanian example that uh, when the Tasmanians were isolated by the rise of the yeah, sea level yeah, that yeah. flooded the Bass Strait, that, yeah. that they lost uh, most of the elements of yeah. the Australian toolkit. This yeah. turns out to be uh, de demonstrable in other situations. When small groups get isolated, uh, they lose tool uh, uh, sophistication. So this implies yeah. that already to get stone tools of, of any sophistication, you already have to be able to manage a pretty large group, which implies implies social rules and norms and, and institutions yeah. and yeah. morality. So but I don't think you can get intelligence uh, and tools without already having yeah. uh, uh, morality uh, evolving along with the, uh, with the tools. A, a very good point. My way of seeing this is that to make tools, you have to have at least a minimum of social organization, a social group which is, has several individuals who collaborate you also have need family organizations. Somebody's going to go hunting, and somebody's going to be to be collecting fruits around. Uh, so I think you need at least incipient or not so incipient social organization. Whether I would call that morality in the early stages, I do not know, but uh, it's perfectly legitimate. Well, I can't quite understand Pete's question because uh, because we know that <coughs> there's tool use by lots of uh, uh, maybe you mentioned birds. But 
Well, the, the, uh, I say tools uh, uh, of any sophistication <coughs> require uh, fairly large tools. It is true that you can get uh, uh, simple tools in yeah. birds, in chimpanzees. Lots of uh, lots of animals have simple tools. So uh, the question is to sustain tool traditions of the yeah, complexity yeah. that, that it, uh, humans start to maintain in the middle yeah. of Lake Taylor with them. But as Peter says, they will be very simple tools and they will not necessarily be culturally transmitted, you know, from generation to generation, as they are not, by and large, although there is a little bit of imitation in chimpanzees, but very little, very much they well, discover the tools in each tribe and each group of, uh, uh, of chimps, so in, yeah, you. Okay, so you need culture to do that, you really need yeah. moral? No, I would think, I mean, it depends how you define morals. Yeah. Uh, I would say you need some social organization but to what extent consciously that are these activities going to be considered as uh, moral? I think you are, you, I will come back here in a moment. Uh, yes, I um, wonder if I could ask you to comment a little about the role of sexual selection in the world in general, a mechanism that, that we haven't talked too much about today. But for example, the large tail of the peacock, uh, if you're a peacock, if you're a male peacock, a large tail <coughs> It's a disadvantage in, in, in escaping from a fox, yeah. but it's a big advantage in attracting a fox. Yeah. Um, and uh, when you know, fox and fox. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I wonder if, if religion might might also have uh, evolved in that same way that that uh, males who are religious were more likely to attract uh, mates. Maybe a fox. I I I. Uh, do not know how what to, co to comment. I have not thought about the problem that way. I don't see immediately why, <laughs> but that's because I have not reached the Homo sapiens stage yet, and I'm so evolving. So yeah. I think that the, the, the males who were, who were uh, uh, big and strong and could defend, that, that would be a certain uh, set of traits that would be advantageous in selecting a mate. But then there might also be males who are more intelligent and maybe not physically so strong, but clever well if you if you talk about intelligence and physical strength I am definitely with you this is <laughs> natural selection but I don't see why I should limit it to the males and why not also to the females although in the animal world sexual selection is very often more significant in in uh, females seeking males are in the, the other way around but the, really what you are talking about is just natural selection more than than really religion. Let me start to come to this side and then I'll go back there. Okay, yes. Um, is what you are saying, I'm just trying to follow up with that question, is that sexual selection, uh, religious sacrifice, for example, can be like the handicap principle and you could uh, it could be a form of signaling in that sense. But it seems to me that religions may counteract this kind of thing by putting caps on ostentation of wealth, consumption, and things like that. So maybe it may go both ways. But uh, again, you are, I think you are, you, it's a good point, but I think there are sorts of variations in terms of religion presence. Yes. And ostentation is not always considered a bad thing in some forms of religion. So it's a uh, sort of things. Michael. You emphasized uh, the cryptic population, um, but um, you didn't talk about what conditions would have led to the rise of cryptic population. That didn't seem, uh, and what, what explanations are there for Well, for um, the, there are two answers. The short one is I have no idea. <laughs> 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 the, the other answer is that once this started to happen, even if only occasionally in a woman, who for whatever the reason, started not to have the, the enlargement of the genital organs, and that will be very advantageous to promoting evolution in the direction that I am saying, because that female, now the male mating with her, uh, we don't know whether Wouldn't she's pregnant or not. Would the have mated with her? If, or I guess it uh, takes I'm, time for this to happen. But. Well, I'm, I'm just oversimplifying the picture. Let us assume that for whatever the reason, one single female is, uh, is stops having I mean, starts having cryptic ovulation. This does not have the external manifestations. When a male comes to meet with her, he doesn't know whether she is getting pregnant or not. So he wants to make sure he will stay there. 
I'm oversimplifying the picture. When that started to happen, we don't know. Almost certainly, by the time of, of uh, Homo habilis, for various other reasons. Yes, back there, you Mike? Yeah, uh, both in your remarks and in uh, some of the statements you quote by Darwin, there are references to morality as uh, being the problem I have with that term, is, especially as an economist, is I'm not sure quite what it means. Uh, <laughs> I think, yes, I know, the, the non-economists are laughing that an economist doesn't understand morality, but bear with me. Uh, how do we define it uh, as something more than just habits or uh, rule-based behavior? I think it's, uh, yeah. What, what is the special concept Thank you. of morality? Thank you. It's a, it's a context. Uh, within which there are many categories. One is the moral category. That is, is the areas where we have values. And, and we have economic values. Uh, we have gastronomic values. We prefer pears to apples, so at least some of us do. And we have, uh, uh, you know, aesthetic values. And of course, then we have moral values. And, and then moral values, and I had some definitions that I could put in, but I could not put in uh, everything there is when you evaluate uh, your own actions in terms of the beneficial consequences they may have for other individuals. It's a definition which is very consistent with utilitarianism, although one doesn't need to be utilitarianist for that. But it's evaluating actions in terms of the benefits that have beneficial consequences for other individuals, for other humans. Yes? So uh, could you... Uh Maybe I missed that a little bit, but could you explain the uh, transition, how the uh, transition to tribalism uh, proceeded from the origin of nuclear families? Okay. The, the link between those yeah, yeah, very good. I went through it very fast. My idea is the key thing there was the formation of the nuclear family. Yeah. Because it, we see what happens in primates and in apes, in the apes, and as we can judge, you know, they are competing always for mating, males with each other. So they will not associate uh, uh, in, in groups, f highly organized groups. But once you have the nuclear family, you have very reason to associate with another nuclear family. There's not competition, it's collaboration. So then that will increase. It's in the seat. Uh, okay, one last question. You said that religion was a human universal, but in the modern world, it's become a social construct. Lots of people seem to get along without it and yeah. don't even understand what yeah. all the fuss is about. <laughs> so I guess there's less need for super, supernatural yeah. explanations today, right. but, but death is as much of a problem as it ever was. Right. So how do you explain Well, it? people deal with anxiety in other ways. Read the existentialist literature of a, of a few decades ago. Uh, but I, when I was saying it's a human universal, I was referring to the history of humankind, that every tribe, every social group, uh, every culture of which we have any residual information, they all show to have had rituals and religious practices. Uh, you can do away without that today, and you can do away without morality too, although I consider you know, a biological attribute. <laughs> was that the last question or the next to the last? No, that was the last question. Okay.